performance string vulnerability that can be exploited remotely. Over the past few videos we have learned how to talk to these programs over a TCP network connection and how to debug them. So we are all set to go. Like all previous challenges, the program is running as a network daemon, in this case on port 2994. So we can use netcat to connect to the service which displays a final one prompt. But when we enter something we don't see anything. Hmm. Also because we already know it would be about a format string vulnerability, we can try to inject some characters such as %x, but again, nothing happens. We could also try %s because if you remember, it will take values on the stack as the address location of a string, thus if values on the stack do not point into valid memory, the program should crash, which would be another indication of a format string vulnerability. But no, also doesn't do anything. We could also try to send a very long string just to see if there is a buffer overflow that would crash a program, but also doesn't work. We can see that the prompt got returned now multiple times, which is an indication that the program always reads a limited amount of characters and you sent so many at once that the read loop was able to read many times. So I guess it's time to have a look at the source code. Main calls two functions after setting up all the networking stuff. The first one is get IP port and the second one is parser. Get IP port calls the function get peer name, so let's see what that is about. Get peer name returns the address of the peer connected to the socket socfd in the buffer pointed to by address. We can see that it also defines a struct soc address in, which apparently will then contain the source IP address and source port by the client that connected to the socket. You can also look up how the struct exactly looks like on the man page for IP. So it will basically contain the port number and the IP address. And the IP address is a 32 byte integer. An sprintf will write this construct string into hostname, which is a global variable. Okay, so once this function is complete, the code will call parser. And parser will print the final one prompt we already know. Then it uses fgets to read 128 bytes into the line buffer. After that it uses trim which looks for the first occurrence of a new line or a line feed and replaces it with a zero, basically cutting the string at these positions. Then it will check if the string you entered starts with username or login. Ah, so there are special commands for that prompt. If you enter username, it kind of expects additional data after it because its string copies anything after the username part into the global variable username. If you would use the command login, it would check if the specified username before. If not, it tells you you follow a wrong protocol. But if you specify the username before, it will call log it with a pointer into the string after login because it expects a password there. The password is not used in logit, it's just a mockup for the challenge, but in there it uses a buffer and writes to it with snprintf, basically creating a line for a log entry that says that there was a login attempt from a certain client for a specific user with a certain password. And then the string logged in the system log. Then this function returns and it will print login failed. Armed with this knowledge, we can try to use the prompt again, and it does what we expect. Now, this failed login attempt should have been logged in the syslog, so let's check it out. Note, you have to be rude to read that file. So tail to only get the last few lines of val log syslog. And there it is, final one login attempt from the source IP and source port as live overflow with the password. Okay. But where the heck is our format string vulnerability? There is no printf where we control the format parameter. Why am I so hasty? We don't even fully understand the code yet, do we? We read this code with certain assumptions without questioning if they are true. The meaning of hacking, if anything, is about understanding computers on a deeper level. But there is one function where we got lazy and brushed over because we assumed it does its job. If you take anything away from the stuff I create, then it shall be, don't be satisfied with what you think you know, challenge your beliefs. Okay, well, that rant was a bit overplaying it, but we did not look into this new function we encountered, syslog. 
I guess what I'm saying is when you solve these simple challenges, you reach a point where you think you know every dangerous function, but that's not true. So don't get lazy and read the man page. If we look at the man page of syslog, we will see that the second parameter is a format parameter. Syslog generates a log message, which will be distributed to syslog d, the syslog daemon. The priority argument is formed by o-ring, the facility and the level values explained below. The remaining arguments are format, as in printf. Syslog works like printf, and buff in logit is the format parameter, and buff will simply contain the username and password we entered, and thus we can inject format characters. Let's try it. Let's log in with percentage %x stuff. Login failed, check the syslog. And there it is. The brackets you can see the leaked values from the stack. Perfect. Now we have identified the bug. And from earlier format string exploit videos, we learned that a good strategy is to overwrite an address in the global offset table with another function, like system, to execute commands. Let's think about what function would be convenient to overwrite. I think the strn compare is a cool function because we control the first parameter, the line, and system uses the first parameter for the string to execute stuff. So if we replace string n compare with system, we can simply type in a line and execute a shell command. Okay, so let's construct our exploit. We import what might be important and set up the remote socket connection like we are used to. And maybe we create a new function called read until which is very useful in these kind of remote service challenges. So read until shall fill up a buffer with single character reads until the buffer contains the magic string specified by read until. And then we can simply write read until the final one prompt and then we can do our stuff. So first we specify a username. Read until next prompt and we specify the login password and read again until the next prompt. Another trick I use is the function raw input, which is actually to read input from the user in Python, but is very convenient to kind of pause the script until we hit enter. So when we execute this now, we connect to the service and then we wait until we hit enter in the script. When we now check the running processes for final one, we see two. If you remember, the one is the parent daemon and the new one with the higher process ID is the spawn child that is handling our client connection. So we can attach GDB to that process and start collecting addresses of important symbols. So first let's figure out the address of strn compare in the global offset table. With info functions and search term, we can find the function trampoline in the PLT quickly. We can disassemble those instructions and we quickly see that it jumps to the address stored here. And this points into the global offset table and will obviously contain the real address to string and compare in libc. So that's our target address we want to overwrite. Next is the address of system. System is part of libc and we can quickly get the address of it here. Note, usually libc is randomized due to ASLR nowadays, but on this old Linux system or embedded devices, it still works this way. On a real modern system, you will first have to leak addresses from memory in order to calculate offsets and break ASLR. Okay, so we have our target and we have the address that we want to write to. Also, the resulting log message will contain your source IP and port, which might vary in length. Coming from local host will be different than coming from a remote host. So we should add this into our exploit to be reliable. The challenge used get peer name to get the IP and port of its peer, so we can use the equivalent to get our own name with get sock name. Now we also know the source IP and port and can write code to adapt accordingly. Also, I'm sorry, the code is really awful to read this way. I don't know why I never bothered to turn on syntax code highlighting. So here we go. Let's have a look again at the logged line from earlier. These characters here are the at the end look suspiciously like ASCII. And when we convert them, we see that spell login from and so forth. So let's do this again with some recognizable characters to find the username. And there it is. So it took roughly 14 pops of the stack to reach the username with the AAA. You can see that the A's don't perfectly align. They even might shift around because of the length of the IP and port. Thus, first step is to make this constant by adapting the amount of A's such that afterwards it will be known aligned offset. 
So in this case, the hostname was 15 characters long and, and one more A would have filled up and aligned the memory. So let's think about what the shortest and longest hostname could be. Shortest would be nine, longest 21. Because we prefer multiples of four to be 32 bit aligned, we decide to pad to 24 characters. Thus we take the length of the host name, subtract it from 24, and then we know how many A's we need. Let's try this again with some percentage X in the username. And we must not forget the new line at the end of our inputs. Oh, doesn't work? What did we do wrong? Ah, we forgot the username and login command. Still doesn't work. Oh, the line can only be 128 bytes long, but we send a lot more with those 28 percentage X and so on. Four. See, so many small things can go wrong and slow you down. Now we get the login failed. And looking into the syslog and searching for the Bs, we see that, God damn it, we forgot to add the padding with the A's. Okay, there we go. The Bs are now perfectly aligned. Awesome. Now it doesn't matter what IP or port you have, it will always be exactly there. And we can count the words on the stack to get to the offset 17. So now we can move on and use a single percentage X with the dollar notation to refer to the 17th parameter, the 17th value on the stack. So for example, we can now place the address of the global offset table entry for strn compare here into the string and then use percentage n to write to that address. So now we only need to figure out how big of a padding we need to write these the values we want. If that confuses you, rewatch the old format string stuff. So before we run it now, add another raw input so that the script doesn't exit when we run it. Attach to it with GDB and observe the GOT entry for strn compare. We see that after the login attempt it got overwritten. Our goal is the lower part of the system address which is fffb0. So now we can calculate the correct number and characters we need to print. And this is basically how the process now works. We write with %n to the address check the number, calculate how much is missing or how much we are overshooting, correct the number of characters we print and repeat until we have constructed the full address for system. That is super annoying, it's fiddly and takes some time, but once you got it, it's pretty cool. So now I got the offset right and the address is all written with the address of system. Now we can add the talent lib trick with interact to our program and theoretically at this point all calls to strn compare would call system instead. And if you look into the code and think about it, simply writing something on the prompt should result in command execution. So let's try it. We get a prompt and now we can type commands if, if we are in a real shell. Every loop the program reads our line calls strn compare which is in reality system and executes our commands. And again, we can copy the exploit to our Windows machine, change the IP address to the VM, and then get a remote shell. Awesome.